Hello everyone and welcome to another session of Mutual Fund Day by Share.Market where we invite top investment professionals from the industry to share their views and perspectives on different investment concepts. The core objective of these sessions is to help you make the informed investment decisions and I hope many of you find these sessions very informative and useful. My name is Vyabhav Jain and today we are going to talk about investing in mid and small cap market segments. The mid and small cap indices have been touching their all-time highs after a period of some volatility recently. Given this context, we will explore if this is the right time to start investing or continue investing in these segments. To help us gain this understanding, today we have Mr. R. Srinivasan with us. He is the CIO equity of SBI mutual funds and currently manages SBI small cap, SBI flexi cap, among other, other SBI funds. He has over 30 years of experience in this industry. Welcome, Mr. Srinivasan, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Pleasure. So, to start with, uh, Mr. Srinivasan, can you help our investors understand how investing in mid and small cap segments or stocks is different from investing in large cap stocks? How different is the risk reward trade off between these two, and how one should balance the risk reward trade off in, in this particular mid and small cap market segments? So, you think of uh the difference between large cap and mid cap or let's say mid slash small cap investing in terms of time. Sure. So my view is that equity investors should invest from a longer term perspective. When I say long term perspective, I'm saying they should have a perspective of at least seven, 10 years, right. if not longer than that. Right? right. I'm talking of a minimum of seven years or 10 years. Sure. Now, the moment you have a longer term perspective, then the capitalization does not matter because the risk that people talk about is really volatility. Now, volatility reduces significantly with time. So one year volatility is higher in the market. Now, within the market, a small cap index will be a lot more volatile than the large cap index if you look at history. But over a period of time, the volatility kind of goes down significantly. So a long if you are a long-term investor, or if I am a long-term investor, I don't really care about volatility. I'll put money now, then I want to kind of figure out what that money will do 10 years hence or even longer. Obviously, I'll track the stock that I'm buying. So there, it does not matter at all. That is my view. Uh, you just need to ensure that you're buying a good stock and a good stock implies you're buying a good business with a good track record of performance at valuations that will make you that return. That is all that matters. In the short term, obviously, uh, large cap investing is uh, less riskier because in the short term, volatility matters. Because if you're investing from a three-year perspective, right? right? Which I would say you shouldn't, but ki log mere sunne wale, <laughs> then, then investing in small gaps is that much more riskier. So you can make more money, you can also lose more money. Whereas in large caps, that volatility is relatively lower. So there, I guess you need to be cognizant. So we actually straddle two philosophies within the house. We are cognizant of the fact that we are a mutual fund, that we have daily NAVs. We tell investors that we invest from a long-term perspective. But our fund managers are expected to perform on three-year rolling basis. They need to outperform the benchmark, need to outperform the peer set. So for a three-year, for a one to three-year perspective, when we kind of put our target prices, when we have certain expectations on certain sectors, we use a different set of factors, which are linked to fundamental momentum and relative valuations, where you're looking at relative outperformance. Whereas when we look at long-term investing, we're looking at like buying a good business with a track record at reasonable valuations. So, so just to follow up on this, of course, as you rightly said, I mean, the tenure uh, or the horizon time period matters, but we see the cycles. Like currently the cycle is seeing that there are a lot of inflows, money flowing into the small and, uh, you know, mid cap segments. Uh, and obviously the resulting, uh, the resultant has been the rich valuation in these segments. So how should investors consider this segment given the current context, if you would uh, provide some insights into that? So again, from a top-down perspective, there has been a lot of buoyancy in the small cap space. So the Nifty really hasn't gone anywhere. Yeah. 2022 
N23 till year till date, the Nifty has probably given an annualized return of like around 6%. Sorry. Whereas uh, the small cap index this year, YTD, is up some 34%. So when you do a simple chart of BSC vis-a-vis -vis the BSC 500, for example, Sensex vis-a-vis -vis BSC 500, there is meaningful underperformance on the large cap side. So if you expect a mean reversion, then you should expect large caps to do much, much better than small and mid caps. That is a top-down perspective. From a bottom-up perspective, when we look at stocks that we like, when we're looking at IPOs, it does seem that the liquidity, the inflows that you've seen is impacting valuations. So everything is kind of pricey. So we typically start with a return expectation of 18 20% if you buy a small caps because of the underlying risks involved, not only on volatility, but also in terms of the business not having uh, had that track record or the management not having delivered for so long or it not being as robust, for example, as a large cap business. But uh, I don't think we are seeing those kind of expected returns when we look at a stock. So valuations are clearly expensive. Mm. And uh, I think that will impact future returns. So, on a risk-return trade-off basis, the risk is higher and the return is not commensurate enough in the small cap space. Yeah. Understood. So, ideally, I mean, if we go about some new investor who is thinking to invest into uh, these segments, obviously, large cap, as you said, is, uh, some, uh, is currently looking at uh, a little more attractive. But if someone is looking to invest in mid-cap and small cap segment, should they start now? And if yes, what should be the right way? I mean, obviously we are, uh, you know, we always preach SIPs and all. So uh, what would your suggestion be? Should investors look at the segment right now? And if yes, then what's the right way to do it? See, let me kind of say that the question itself has a problem in the sense that you are assuming that the way to invest is by categorizing stocks into large caps, mid caps and small caps, right? <laughs> If you are a long-term investor, that I'm saying first, that is not really the way to go. The way to go is really uh, understand the business model, take a view on it, look at the management stack record, their ability, and buy at an attractive price. Now, in all these three factors that I talked about, business management valuations, there is no capitalization. So that is the base point that I want to clearly you know, bring up. Right? So... It is all stock specific. It does not matter what you are buying as long as you're buying a good business run by good guys at a valuation which will make you money. Now, having said that, since you are talking about how an investor should uh, structure his portfolio, that was your question, right? How much yes, large so caps exactly. and how much small caps? Asset allocation, basically. across. So, the so there is one very simple way to think about it. So top 100 stocks, so let me kind of put the same thing in a different way. So the top 100 stocks are large caps. Correct. There are some, uh, let's say, 800, 900 companies out there mm -hmm. which are reasonably traded. In fact, liquidity is very low, lower down that curve. If you want to buy, say, 30 stocks and build a portfolio, what is the likelihood that you will buy a small and mid cap? So 10% population, Large caps, 90% population, small and mid caps. So the probability of you looking at that 90% universe is higher. Now, also assume that 70% of the small cap or small mid cap universe is junk, which you will not touch with a watch pool. 10% of the large cap universe is junk because large caps are a lot more stable. That is why they are large caps. So then you have 90 stocks here yeah, and you have maybe 100, 200 stocks there. Even yeah, then yeah. you're looking at some mix of like one third, two third. So I'm just telling you as a portfolio manager, the likelihood of me having a small and mid cap stock in my portfolio, everything else remaining same, mm -hmm. valuations and everything else is almost 50-50, probably higher in favor of small and mid caps. That again will be a function of size now, whether I whether the fund, uh, whether the liquidity is good enough for that size of the fund. 
got it that sounded uh, like so, a complicated answer i hope it was no 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 that's not complicated so let me just you know kind of tweak the question uh, or, or maybe a uh, second part of this question how you are looking as a fund manager i understood obviously because of the liquidity and the capitalization does not play a part but if we are talking about the end investor uh, he generally thinks about you know kind of x percentage in large cap uh, fund not stocks but let's say some uh, amc's large cap fund some in mid cap or small cap fund from the asset allocation point of view now because of the sebi is the mc is constrained about x percentage in particular segments uh, then how would you probably you know kind of advise these investors to look into investing either in large cap or mid cap large or mid cap and all these kind of various categorization which uh, the regulator has actually made so i would just approach fund selection so for example we approach stock selection in a way where we really do not consider market cap we look at the factors that i talked about yeah. i think investors should also look at fund selection independent of market cap yeah. i know this is not popular i know nobody follows this but that is my view you look at fund selection by looking at the fund house pedigree you look at the fund manager's track record you look mm. at the strength of the team the quality of the team so you have to do some subjective analysis there you look at the attrition for example yeah you look at the philosophy of that particular portfolio or that particular fund manager you cross check the philosophy in terms of what he's been doing whether it is in sync right and then you take a call on a fund just like we take a call on a stock it really i mean these so the way to think about uh how to kind of structure your portfolio into caps is simply to think in terms of volatility so if you are worried about volatility you should not be in small and mid caps right okay. if you are even more worried about volatility you should not be in equities correct you should only do debt right so volatility is risk higher the risk higher the return so it's very tough for me to give you like a one size fits all answer in terms of what the fund structure or what break up he should have between large caps and small caps true when we say personal finance is personal so it all depends upon your risk profile and uh, ha, matlab, i can only say ki as a port see the, i will manage my money the same way i look at portfolios as a portfolio manager correct let's say i am not a portfolio manager i am an individual investor if i am going to create portfolio then i really don't care about what market capitalization bucket that stock is assuming that i am invested for a longish period if i am mm-hmm. investing for a short term period then obviously i will look at large cap because i don't want to draw down mm-hmm. when i need so um, coming back to the point which we discussed that you look at particularly like business models and corporate governance when you are selecting stocks as a fund manager uh, would you be able to tell what all kind of you know kind of these parameters you generally look uh, the team generally looks at sbi when they are selecting the stocks so we have two philosophies that we run one is a relative return philosophy which applies for sh- relatively short periods right so we have like a market timing model which looks at markets your break up so you talked about market capitalization right so this model looks at equity vis a vis debt from a one to three year perspective then we have a philosophy on which we also use a quantitative model mm-hmm. which looks at stocks from a two to three year perspective then we have a philosophy which looks at stocks from a longer term perspective say beyond three years five years seven years right. the longer term philosophy which we like to call the core philosophy we also call it the absolute return philosophy basically looks at very different factors it looks at the strength of the business model it looks at the track record of the management and it looked at looks at valuations not in terms of like multiples which are like thumb rule shortcuts but we kind of apply the thesis on a discounted cash flow model mm-hmm. right and then we evaluate a stock the relative return thesis the, which we call the satellite philosophy that looks at fundamental change so fundamental change as in change in revenues margins volumes specific factors for the sector currency for example uh, 
um, return on capital employed. It looks at expectations. So you are ideally looking for rising expectations, which means we're looking at analyst upgrades in the large cap space. So we do the quant model on the large cap space. We also look at technical momentum. So basically you're looking for change, largely fundamental, a bit of technical, and you're looking at relative valuations. Why are you looking at relative valuations? Because this strategy inherently is attempting to beat the benchmark and create excess returns yeah. on a relative on a shorter term basis, say three to five years. Whereas the other strategy that I talked about, that is thinking in terms of absolute return. Obviously, the absolute return target is high enough that if we go right, we will automatically beat the benchmark. So let's say uh, our expectation of benchmark return over a longish period is say 12, 13%, then we will target 16, 17% absolute return. Even if we go wrong, we will still get a meaningful uh, excess return even on the absolute return philosophy. The relative return philosophy will be less volatile relative to the benchmark. The absolute return philosophy will be a lot more volatile because we will not benchmark at all. We will assume that our return will beat the benchmark without looking at the stocks that are there in the benchmark. So these are like, and obviously we go much deeper in terms of the process. There is an idea generation process. There is a channel check framework. So because we are covering so many stocks, we do not rate our ability to understand businesses very well, mm -hmm. even managements for that matter. Yeah. So obviously we try to look at long-term performance, but we also speak to competitors and vendors and suppliers and customers to get a better perspective. And we are typically, when it comes to new ideas and IPOs, we are we start with a rejection mode. Even though we are getting a lot of money, we are uh, perforce, we need to look for new ideas to invest or add up on the same ideas that we have, we still are in a rejection mode when it comes to researching a stock. My next question was exactly on this point that, you know, kind of uh, with the kind of inflows we are seeing in the recent past in the mid and small cap segments, is the size becoming a constraint in terms of investable opportunities? Uh, because obviously the liquidity and all things are there. And the way the AUMs have been increasing in the small cap segments. So how do you, you know, kind of look at uh, allocating higher values to particular stocks or maybe just increase the number of stocks in your uh, uh, fund? No, so it is a challenge. So we've kind of stopped taking money in our small cap fund since 2017. Yeah. No, so, so we only, yeah, we only, uh, we opened it for a very small, we opened it for some thousand crores odd yeah. when the market fell into COVID. Because we thought that was a good opportunity. So that closed, that window closed in like a few months. We haven't stopped the SIP. And uh, I'm very surprised that we get some 2.2, 2.3 million SIPs. Our average SIP size is actually only 2,500. Maybe between 2,500 to 3,000. Uh, the overall cap is actually 25,000 per pan. Yeah. But still we're getting gross flows of like 550 crores odd. But since we are facing redemptions, net flows are lower. Okay. So the answer to your question is, we've had this problem for a while. And that problem has kind of gotten, it's kind of become even larger uh, with the markets doing what they are. So we are short of ideas. We, ha we haven't so we are not stopping the SIPs because these are really small ticket SIPs. Yeah. Uh, and we are also a little apprehensive about increasing the number of holdings. We have around 53 or 54 stocks. We don't want to expand that beyond a point. Uh, so it is a challenge, which is why we have, we're sitting on a lot of cash. In addition to cash, we also have Nifty Futures. Well, I think 8 to 10% of cash is there in your portfolio currently. If I'm correct, not... correct. 10% cash and almost 10% nifty futures. Yeah. We don't want to dilute the fund, uh, uh, at least the look of it, by buying large caps. So we are average, our weighted average market cap is actually half the small cap yeah. cutoff. So it will be around 11,500 crores. Right. Whereas a small cap cutoff will be closer to 20, 21,000 crores. Yeah. So there is, the we've maintained the flavor of small caps. Excluding the Nifty, I'm saying. Obviously, if we include the Nifty, average weighted market cap will be much higher. But I'm saying exclude in the Nifty and the cash, 
the weighted average market cap is around less than 12000 crores so the flavor is still there but we are finding it tough because what i remember uh, looking at the you know kind of the bigger amc small cap i think sbi small cap is the lowest number of stocks in their small cap portfolios otherwise there are few funds which like about 150 to 200 stocks as well uh, so yeah which i think is ridiculous here in fact i am not comfortable with 55 stocks my ideal portfolio size is closer to 25 30 <laughs> right true but of course with the constraints of the investments and all you have to go a little higher correct so correct just one thing the problem with owning more stocks is that you not owning more of what you like then how will you make money right exactly uh just to understand one more thing so as we say obviously we know the constraints of you know kind of mid cap stocks for a mid cap fund and uh, small cap uh, stocks for a small cap fund there are only 150 stocks in the mid cap segment but then after 250 stocks the entire space opens up for the small cap stocks so obviously we get into the liquidity kind of or tradeability kind of debates uh, uh, hence or but do you think there is a lot more universe to invest into the small cap stocks reserves maybe the large in the mid cap stocks no you should not look at this in terms of number of stocks because the liquidity peters down very significantly so the large cap universe is only 100 stocks right but i am i don't know the exact number but this will be more than 70% 75% of the market cap yeah correct maybe even more in terms of free flow right so liquidity is a function of size and the free flow so just because there are more number of stocks so let's say uh you have a new segment micro cap 500 <laughs> stock on which so the 500 ke niche 1000 1500 1000 stock hai but liquidity nahi hai so then there is no point right number of stocks really don't matter 150 is a decent number again the constraint is a how much money comes into mid cap funds so what is the total size of mid cap funds relative to the uh, universe that you can buy in terms of free float those are things you will need to consider liquidity is already uh, challenged i think in a lot of definitely in small cap funds i am presuming also in mid cap funds so no plans to open up a micro cap fund micro cap mein this problem will compound because micro cap <laughs> mein see the problem with micro cap is micro cap is a subset of uh, small cap so if you create a micro cap fund then will micro caps be allowed in the small cap fund yeah if it is not allowed then whatever we own what will we do with that <laughs> so Absolutely. it's not very easy it has to you have to kind of think differently in terms of uh, sizes will be a huge constraint i don't think you can raise more than 500000 crores in a micro cap yeah. type fund then what's the point and probably if you can then uh, again the question comes in whatever we are discussing about small cap where we will invest in uh, that kind of a money that kind of fund in these stocks uh, so coming to another point sir on a different note you are one of the few select fund managers in the country who had some allocation to international equities a few years ago i guess which are not overseas funds per se it's not an fof kind of a thing so given the restrictions on mutual funds for foreign investments these days in the recent times and the absence of indexation on investment in international funds investing in these global funds has been disinvestified in some way So in such a scenario, uh, do funds as yours, which provide some exposure to foreign equities, could play a slightly more important role in the investor's portfolio diversification, global diversification, or something like that? I guess so, but you have to kind of look at what percentage of the fund okay. is in international stocks because we are capped at the fund house level. Yeah. So if if a small fund, see. it's interesting actually this question is very interesting if when why did we go international we went international because we were finding it tough from a liquidity perspective mm. to manage within the universe mm. that we had right. which is why we went international so we went international actually in the large cap in the larger funds not the large cap fund the larger funds so obviously uh, while a significant amount of money is invested in international stocks the percentage is not so significant now you can have a higher percentage of international stocks in smaller funds right but the moment the fund becomes smaller liquidity is not a constraint 
so the universe is actually much wider in india where we prefer those small cap names to international names uh, we do own a couple of international stocks in the smaller funds so there is no real restriction there because we have we have around a billion dollars international yeah. stocks yeah. so we can always technically let's say buy up to 30% in a local fund in international yeah. stocks but we don't feel the need to do it because the with the fund size is small then the opportunities are attractive enough in india but we do that there is this fund called global where the it's like a mnc fund where there are three buckets we invest in mncs in terms of pedigree lever nestle types then we invest in stocks which have a more than 50% outside india and then the third bucket is international stocks so there the percentage is higher so to that extent such a fund may be interesting because it adds diversification if an investor needs it in the first place but also keep in mind that we were buying international stocks for two reasons one from a liquidity perspective yes manage fund like overall fund liquidity and also as a three reasons first is liquidity second is we do think that a lot of these stocks that are outside are a lot more attractive on a risk return trade off basis because not everywhere do you see valuations being distorted by flows Correct. and thirdly there are certain unique businesses that you don't find in india right technology for example so so it definitely makes sense to have a certain percentage there i think in the listed space all the you know kind of upcoming sectors we don't find in india it's all in the private space as of now so of course it adds value to look at the us stocks which are into the 5g and all these autonomous vehicles and all space so yeah makes sense uh, liquidity part i was not very aware of but this is a good fresh perspective i got uh, why yeah I, yeah that is why we started actually so we have this focus on 30000 crores yeah 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 of course in that so you don't want uh, to kind of uh, yeah okay in one of the interviews uh, you recently mentioned loving peter bevelin's book all i want to know is where i am going to die so i'll never go there so to give some context to our viewers the book is basically about a fictitious character who seeks wisdom from warren buffett and charlie munger which is a collection of their interactions from various sources Now, one of the messages of the book was why it was important to avoid big mistakes and errors rather than seeking success so uh, can you help us to understand the set of processes uh, you have in place in sort of risk management uh, we have already talked about your uh, you know kind of characters or the business model and all those aspects but what about the risk management kind of points so we are extremely hung up on not losing money here because if you lose money it's very tough to kind of um, come back so we run so we are a large house mm. we have a large team we have uh, senior analysts who've done like 18 20 years in that sector yeah. so they have a good grip on stocks and the sector frameworks uh, we also we have a lateral research team uh, we for example i told i spoke about the q score which is the quant model right which runs uh, on the top 100 companies where we're yeah. looking at these factors that the analyst is supposed to think in terms of any applies a target price to a stock we have a forensic model which has mm -hmm. some 18 factors uh, which throws up red flags i think the coverage on it is like 650 or 6700 companies right now and uh, so it throws up red flags and the analyst is supposed to explain those red flags uh, so these red flags could emerge because let's say cw ip on gross black is extremely high relative to the sector miscellaneous expenditure is high the auditor is not qualified enough he hasn't done audit for a lot of other companies so there are various cash flow conversion to ebita right so these red flags come up and the analyst has to explain that automatically kind of there is like a check right we are generally hung up on governance so we are sitting out of uh, a lot of ipos due to valuation but we've always we generally avoided these large falls in specific stocks because we are in a rejection mode and if there is a governance issue for example we typically prefer to stay out so there is a process the, the, it is part of the investment process right uh, what else uh, there is we do a valuation check on what's in the price which is a reverse dcf across the entire universe and the index aggregates uh, other than i'm i'm not even talking about the regular uh intensity that the analyst runs when he uh, initiates a stock for example 
where he has to present the stock. There are devil's advocates who counter his view. So it's like a dialectical process. Uh, so a lot of these things, I can go on and on, but yeah. Thanks, thanks for that. Sir. So I just want to touch the last question for the day and a bit on a lighter note. So you have been in the industry for close to now three decades and uh, love the zeal you have to pick good businesses, which we have discussed in this interview anyways, how you pick up businesses. Um, and small cap investment is obviously the toughest of the lot as uh, we discussed. What has kept you going year after year, you know, kind of for three decades and what would be the mantra, what would be your, uh, you know, kind of uh, lessons for the young investors who are looking to make a career into this kind of a space? This is easy to explain here. Our job is fun. So we have, for example, managements who have, uh, who are actually doing the grind. Yeah. They sit with us for hours. They explain to us their business model. They're very happy to spend time. And uh, typically, you should pay for this to listen to some expert uh, telling us, telling you how he goes about and how he runs his business. We not only get it for free, we actually get paid for it. <laughs> yeah. We paid, get paid a decent amount of money. So, uh, this is fun. So what we do is like a, a job that anybody would die for. So there is absolutely no, uh, it's very easy to have the drive. I mean, you want to kind of come to office and do this day in, day out. So in our job, you don't want to retire. The company will ask you to go home, but you don't want to retire. The, the nature of the job is such. You are, you're effectively reading, you're learning new things all the time understanding businesses so that's very easily explained people love the job you are working and you will excel into it in the long run absolutely it? absolutely it's like uh, if you're playing cricket or playing soccer and you like to play the game and then you're getting paid for it or catchy like or catchy sir i think uh, thank you so much for your thank insights you. and uh, really helpful for our investors to understand uh, the perspective on investing in different cap segments and how SBI thank you. actually looks at into it. So thank, thank you, you so thank much. you. It's been a pleasure. Bye. Investments in securities market are subject to market risks. Read all the related documents carefully before investing.